idea. A way to share a video without waiting on the mail. What do you think? Anyway, as I said on the phone, I think this may be the easiest way to get you up to speed on what I'm dealing with here. And before you ask, no, we don't have releases for the family. They refused to have their likeness involved in any way. However, they did allow me the use of Jessica's drawings. We will need to change their names when we get to the writing stage. Regardless, I think you'll be able to see why I think this will make one hell of a book. So, prior to our first session, each member of the family was given the standard questionnaire. The results are as followed. The patient's name is Jessica Daniels. Jessica, or Jess as she prefers to be called, is 7 years old. Normal birth, no complications, no no medical issues. She's intelligent, sweet, friendly, and highly empathetic. The child was born in Houston, Texas, where she never had issues in school or socializing with peers or adults. The family bought the Clark's house, beautiful house. I love how it's built up on columns. And I'm sure you remember the Clarks from your time here. Sweet old couple. They own that little dive you used to drag me to for lunch. What was it? Oh yeah, the Burger Shack. <clears throat> but anyway, according to her mother, Carol, Jess had a particularly tough time adjusting. She didn't notice anything out of the ordinary until the second week, Wednesday night to be exact. They think it was after midnight when Jess ran into her mother's room screaming. She claimed there were people living under the house. Carol dismissed this as a nightmare, but it started happening night after night until Jess finally refused to sleep in her room. She moved the child's bed to her room, but Jess continued to wake up saying the same thing. She could hear people talking under the floor. Carol made sure to note that Jess never had problems sleeping in Houston. Adam, the child's father, fed up with having the child sleeping in the room, devised a simple solution. He brought her under the house, tried to show her that there wasn't anything there. And according to Adam, there wasn't, but Jess was convinced she saw something. The girl got into a ball and screamed until her voice gave out. She's been mute since that day. After a series of tests and multiple second opinions, no physician could find anything wrong. There's nothing hindering the girl from speaking. Therefore, the conclusion is that her condition is mental in nature. The drawings you are seeing are currently her only form of communication. From observations and the questionnaire, I have a few thoughts on the other family members. Carol Daniels. She's the children's primary caregiver. From what I can observe, she's a caring mother. However, she is deeply resentful of her husband, Adam, for forcing them to move from Houston to Kate's Crossing. Adam Daniels is an obvious workaholic. He spends the majority of his time at work. Dean, her brother, typical early teen. He wasn't happy about the move, but seems to be adjusting adequately. Give me a call after you digest this material. Love to talk strategy. Hi Jess, my name is Miss Julia. How are you today? Has your mom or dad told you why you're here? So how about we get to know each other? Would you like that? What's your favorite food? Mine, spaghetti. What's your favorite color? I like that one too. Tell me about your family. Why are you frowning? OK, 
Okay. So how about you tell me who that is? Did your mom or your dad get him for you? That's very sweet. Tell me more about your friend. I want to make a note here. She stared in the corner of the room as if she was waiting for permission. She then shook her head in the negative. Is someone here, Jess? Is that your friend in the corner? Another note. That clearly looks like a face. It appears that she has an imaginary friend. What's their name? Maybe we could all play together. No, she would no longer participate in my questions at this point. Regardless, I thought this was a decent first session. Let's try to talk by the end of next week. So how are you doing today? And what did you do last night? Let's play a game. If a genie came out of a bottle and granted you three wishes, what would those be? How about I go first then? I'm hoping the last one can be true. Want to try? Are these angels? Is this who you think lives under your house? So you wish they'd leave? Let's talk about your friend, okay? Okay, John. Again, the girl stared into the corner of the room almost like she was waiting for permission. Is that your friend? What's their name? Would you tell me their name if I gave you a sucker? How about two? One for you and one for them. Once again, the girl looked into the corner of the room, then shook her head yes. Note. I have to admit, I found that image quite disturbing. However, it isn't the creepiest imaginary friend that I've had drawn for me. Does your friend live under the house? How many friends live under the house? Why do you think they're there? Are you still scared of them? Would you like them to go away? <gasps> Note, a picture frame fell off the wall. It was located in the corner of the room she claimed her friend was standing. Needless to say, it gave us both a good jump. Ha <laughs> ha. So, 10 imaginary friends. That child has a lot to say, but she's having trouble finding someone to say it to. Most likely the father. For homework, I'm going to try and have dad ask questions. 
mirror what we're doing at home. All right, John, I look forward to our chat Sunday. Bye. And sorry this tape is a little late, but I think I have rats. Something has snuck into my office and eaten all the candy. Hey John, tomorrow is Jess's appointment, but I had a few thoughts I'd like to share, so forgive me if I start rambling. You and I have seen quite a few disturbing children's drawings. But I must admit, after re-examining this drawing, I feel there is something oddly true about this image. I feel like this drawing is rooted in something the child has seen, perhaps a movie or something on the news. Maybe Dean tried to scare her, or it could be as simple as a scary story. I've even thought that maybe the imaginary children might represent friends she left behind in Houston. Maybe Maya was her best friend. Hey Jess, would you like to play another game? Let's draw a picture of you as an adult. Why do you want to be a doctor? And I'm sure you will. That's a very good quality to have. So what does Maya want to be when she grows up? Note, as you might suspect John, Jess once again became fixated with the same corner of the room. She shook her head in the negative over and over and the motions became more and more aggressive. And as I was about to stop the young girl, Jess picked up a crayon. Why is that, Jess? Note, I'll be honest, John. I was scared to ask that question. Everybody gets to grow up, Jess. You think Maya is dead? Why was she in the trunk? What can you tell me about her friends? Do you play with the other friends? And why is that? Does Maya want to hurt you? Before you go, Jess, can you do me a favor? For our next session, can you tell me more about your friends? Draw them? Note, and I'm sure you will ask, I don't know how she knew I was out of candy. 
There was a moment she was alone when she first arrived. Maybe she peeked in the desk. That's likely it, or the child is talking to the dead. Usually my conversations with Mrs. Daniels don't extend too much beyond the session and pleasantries, but this time I could tell the woman was in distress. She asked quite a few questions about Maya. I of course told her that most children have imaginary friends and that I wouldn't worry. She was also very curious about the Clarks and if they had any children. Of course, as far as I know, the Clarks didn't. When I questioned her curiosity, she mentioned that they have found some old toys such as Jess's bear a toy truck, and a few other things. Mrs. Daniels also mentioned that Jess has been taking things and hiding them in her room as well as under the house. I'll have to ask her about this in the next session.
There is a lot to unpack here. At times, I feel as if she was antagonizing Adam with the drawing, almost like she was trying to push him away just to see if he'd stay. Unfortunately, Adam did just as she expected. Jess probably won't speak until she can finally let this world go and accept that her parents' problems aren't her fault. Speaking of which, I probably should recommend a good marriage counselor for Adam and Carol. Alright John, I'm looking forward to your thoughts as usual.
am very concerned for Jess as well as her entire family. It's fortunate that she was able to let go of the delusion, but it is concerning how quickly she chose to buy into it. If things continue to deteriorate, we may need child services to step in. Let's speak after you get this. Talk soon, John. Hi John, it's a few hours before Jess's session, and I just received a phone call that absolutely made my day. Adam called and asked if I had a reference for a marriage counselor. This is an incredible step forward. I'd like to think that it was something I did, but the likelihood is Carol's recent actions have had an effect. Or at least in his own words, it's time to focus on what's important. This gives me a tremendous amount of hope. Even if they can't save their marriage, they may be able to learn how to cope and keep their problems from spilling onto Jess. Note, considering what I have reviewed in the homework and the conversation with Mrs. Daniels, I was surprised to find Jess in such a chipper mood. Jess, how are you today? Oh, hello Maya. So what's new with you? Note, she opened a manila folder and handed me a note from her dad. Note, clearly Adam is turning a corner. I believe this will be very important in getting Jess to start speaking again. This is great, Jess. So is this why you're in such a good mood? Of course it is. Either place sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. I'll keep my fingers crossed for the mountains. Did you have a chance to do the homework? Note, John, I thought I was prepared to see what she wanted to show me. I was wrong.
Note, these images are coming from somewhere. I can't believe all of this is the product of her imagination. A young girl shouldn't be able to recall some of these details. So who are these people? Well, thank you for doing this. Will it be okay with you and Maya if I keep these? Thank you. So Jess, why do you think you stopped speaking? So you don't think you'll ever speak again? Depends on what? Absolutely. You can ask me anything. John, I've never mentioned your name to Jess or her parents. They know I'm interested in writing about Jess's case, but they don't know that I'm collaborating with another therapist. I need to think about this a little more. I'll get back to you. John, I know you disagree, but I'm leaving for the library. I have to know if any of this is true. I know you think there's a logical explanation not rooted in the supernatural, but unfortunately, I just don't see it. I have never mentioned your name. Your name isn't written anywhere in my office. It's not even on the tapes. And no, I don't edit these videos in the same location I see patients. I've gone over every suggestion you gave me, and none of them line up, not one. Look at it this way. If I find nothing, this will be your chance to rub it in. Tell me you told me so. God knows it wouldn't be the first time. But if I do find something, then I'm not sure if I'm the right person to help this girl. took most of the day, but after going back nearly 10 years, I found what I was looking for.
real John. They were someone's children, someone's babies. But why are they under that house? Why are they drawn to Jess? Did the Clark see them too? I understand if you want out of this, John. I know you're not that comfortable. Hold on. Hello? Speaking? What? When? I understand. Thank you. John, Adam was just murdered. Adam's funeral went like you might imagine. I didn't expect a big turnout, though. Apparently, Adam was more popular than I thought. Even the Clarks came to pay their respects. But I suppose Kate's Crossing has always been a friendly place. Poor Adam probably wouldn't agree. Police said it was a carjacking gone wrong, a closed casket funeral. I don't want to know what they mean by gone wrong. I really feel for Carol and the kids. With everything they've already been through, I imagine the situation seems impossible. I just want to help, but I really don't know how. Carol told me in passing that they were moving back to Houston. She said Jess wanted to do one more session before they left. I should be hopeful, but I keep thinking about what she wrote in the homework. Do I show Carol the articles and beg her to stay, or let them go and hope for the best? And if they do go, how do I help those poor children trapped under the house? It's just too much, John. Too much. I have a week before her session. I'm going to think it over. Note. I've gone back and forth on this, but after the session, I'm going to share the articles with Carol. If it were me, I'd want to know. Hi Jess, how are you today? I know, but that's okay. It's natural to be sad when we lose someone we care about. Oh my God, Jess, I'm so sorry. You shouldn't be seeing something like this. Is that Shelly in the background? Does she know who that is? Really? Where? Can you ask her again? Shelly disappeared a decade ago. That can't be a coincidence. Jess, I want you to tell your friends that I want to help them. 
but I need any information they can give me. Can Shelly or Maya ask the others? Anything might help. Note, she started acknowledging people in every direction. I got the uneasy feeling that this room was filled with children. Once the young girl looked in charge, she placed her finger on her lips to silence whoever was speaking. Finally, she pointed across the room, then started writing. Thank you, Jess. Everybody. I'll do my best to try and figure this out. John is a friend. We went to school together. We worked together for a few years. He lives in Florida now with his wife and kid. And what Maya has noticed is that I send him tapes of our conversations. I was hoping he could help me with your case and we were thinking about writing a book about you and your friends. No, not yet anyway. Does this bother you or your friends? Your mom told me that you were going back to Houston. Why not? I'm going to try and talk to your mom, okay? Like before, the following notes are from memory.
Jess's last session was two weeks ago. The next day, Carol left with Dean and Jess. They didn't get more than two miles away from the house when Jess had a violent seizure. Jess hasn't been the same since. She no longer communicates. She just sits in the corner, blankly staring at the wall. Talk later, John. I'm afraid we are going to lose Jess. Yesterday she had her fourth seizure. The poor child seems weaker by the day. Every time the phone rings, I'm afraid it's Carol calling me with the worst. The good news is that Jess still communicates. Each morning I find several of her drawings waiting for me in the office. At least, I hope that it's her leaving me drawings. Jess is not dead yet. There has to be a way to save this girl, a way to get her soul back in her body. But time is running out. I called the Clarks in desperation. I was surprised they moved back to Kate's Crossing. Apparently, RV life didn't suit them. Mrs. Clark probably thought I was crazy. I can't imagine too many people who expect to get a call asking if they've seen ghost children in their home. I gave her Maya's name, Brad, Shelley, Wendy, Mark, all of them. She was clueless. She couldn't recall anything weird ever happening in that house. I must have sounded hopeless. She asked me several times to come by their place, said we could talk over lemonade. 
I of course declined. I just don't have the time. Jess doesn't have the time. This is outside my realm of expertise. I probably should call a priest, but I've always been more comfortable behind a stack of books than kneeling on a pew. The following are the notes I accumulated over three days of continuous research. I never would have imagined that there were so many books dedicated to spirits, ghosts, demons, and the afterlife. What the hell am I missing? I've been racking my head for days. What am I not seeing? It's like Jess said, the ghosts only see pieces. They were at the Burger Shack, John. And who do these drawings look like? Oh 
my God, it was the Clarks, and I've told them everything. I need to go to the police. But who's going to believe this? The Clarks are one of the most prominent families in Kate's Crossing. And I can't believe that a child's drawings will hold up in a court of law. I need to get Carol and those kids out of that house. And I shuddered to think what would have happened if I took Mrs. Clark's offer for lemonade. I'd probably be under that house, too. Hello? Really? That's incredible news. Yes, I'll be right over. And Mrs. Daniels, I have a lot to tell you. I don't think we can trust the Clarks, but we'll talk more when I get there. John, Jess woke up, but I'm sure you'll hear about this before you get the tape. I'm dropping this in the mail as I leave for the Daniels. If I or any of us disappear, it was the Clarks. So many thoughts were racing through my mind as I drove to the Daniels home. The Clarks, Adam, the children, Jess. Why was she able to wake up now? What changed? Did I do something? Hell, maybe the ghost let Jess go. Maybe she escaped. Why does this feel too easy? And why is it when you have somewhere to be, you hit every red light? It was like something was telling me to stay away. The moment I walked through the front door, I found Mr. Clark pointing a gun in my face. Jess wasn't awake. I was lured here, and I didn't need to guess why. I knew in my heart that this was my fault. We were all going to die. John, I know you've heard me tell this story a dozen times now. But the following drawings are Jess's account of the event. Although she was unconscious for the majority of the experience, Jess was incredibly accurate.
John, I knew I only had one shot to survive this. I needed the children to remember. The children were in this house with the Clarks for years, and they never made contact. I needed the Clarks to confess, admit to the crime, and if my time being a therapist has taught me anything, people want to validate their actions. You just need to know how to ask. The children ripped the Clarks apart, then dragged every piece back into the shadows. They left nothing, not even blood. After that, Jess woke up. The only thing left of the Clarks was their gun and a news story. No one will ever know what they did except us, and they will probably always be remembered as the kindly couple who owned the Burger Shack. But according to Jess, they got what they deserved. It's been two weeks since Jess woke up. Carol said things felt different in the home, brighter. She said it felt like a different house. Carol told me they were finally moving back to Houston. Jess had been in a great mood since, but she still has not said a word. Maybe the children took her voice with them. So how are you today? Are you looking forward to moving back to Houston? I'm sure he is, Jess. 
Your mom said you still aren't speaking. Have you given it a try? No. Jess just shrugged and smiled. Looks like I got my wish. I got a happy Jess after all. Have you seen Maya or the others? They are free now. No, John. Her little voice was the sweetest sound I've ever heard. We spent the rest of the session playing old board games. We had a good time, and then after, we said goodbye. Like I said, John, this would make one hell of a book, but I don't think it's a book I can write, at least not now. Maybe one day I'll come back to this case, maybe. Besides, no one will ever believe it. I think it would be better to just let these children rest. Sorry to waste your time, John. We can talk it over when I come down for Thanksgiving. It's been 10 years since I've looked at these tapes. I thought about destroying them, but that doesn't feel right. I followed up on Carol, Dean, and Jess. Carol has a job in some accounting firm. She never remarried. Dean went to college. He's studying finance. Jess seems to be happy. She's about to graduate and move to New York for college. Carol says she doesn't remember Maya or the ghost children. Neither her or Dean ever bring it up. And maybe neither should I.